What a wonderful Sabbath that uh, the Lord has granted unto us this day, that uh, we may hear the birds of the air sing, the trees sway unto his praises, and uh, the saints worship by via live streaming, share ideas, and uh, cancel each other, admonish each other, inspire each other unto faith that uh, cannot be shaken by anything. And so I thank the Lord for everything that He's doing, He's preparing His people, and uh, for those who are giving themselves, the Lord will be able to use them to finish the work. We know that uh, we are in the closing scenes. doesn't matter. I, I always say if the Lord will come in one year, ten years, a hundred years, whichever. Yet you may end your life today. And uh, if the life, your life has to be ended today, where shall you be found, your name? And when the role is called up yonder, will your name appear among the righteous who... Uh, the Lord has enabled to make them fit as his vessels to inherit the kingdom. Those who will be able to uh, be part of the kingdom without causing a revolution. Welcome, brothers and sisters, for this uh, presentation. This is being brought to you by the Gospel Sounders. Rekindling Reformation. This is a ministry dedicated to spreading the three angels' messages around the globe, not only in Kenya, not only in East Africa, not only in Africa, but uh, in the four corners of the world, to send forth missionaries to finish up the work. And so, I'm glad to be presenting this Lateran series on the behalf of the Gospel Sounders Rekindling Reformation Ministry. We are in number 10 of our presentation, and it is the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God. There is what I want to look at, the experience that will bring God's people, the seal of God. I hope that uh, you will be blessed wherever you are tuned in. I pray that uh, the Lord will be with you and uh, you will be encouraged in uh, your daily duties to give your life to Christ so that He may work for you and in you to accomplish his purpose. I want us, as we start this, just to pray and uh, go into the presentation of the hour that is the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God. Let us pray. Abba Father in heaven, thank you so much. We are so glad that we can be able to speak the truth still. And so help us to listen to the voice of thy spirit. Speak to us in thy tenderest way. 
give us the strength to endure the things that will happen in this world, increase our faith, and above all, help us to be channels of light in thy sanctuary. We pray, believing that uh, this prayer mingled with the blood of thy Son, which is pure, will be accepted, and after smelling of it, you will leave for us a sweet oblation, a sweet sacrifice, a blessing, and you will join thyself unto us, you will bind us unto thyself, and seal our hearts for thy courts above in heaven, never to wander away, in Jesus' name, amen. And so, brothers and sisters, Thank you so much, and uh, we have covered eight presentations so far, and this are 21 part series. Pray the Lord is blessing us so much. I would like to turn to the book of Revelation. I like to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 14 Revelation chapter 14 Revelation chapter 14 from verses 14 Revelation 14 from verses 14 and I'll tie in some things which are important in those verses let us, let us look at this closely 14 14 to 16 and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. When you look at the book of uh, Revelation chapter 14, so closely verses 14 to 16, you see there is a harvest. And then from verse 17, it is followed with another harvest. So what is this harvest that uh, we are seeing in Revelation chapter 14, 14 to 16? What is this harvest that we are seeing in Revelation chapter 14? Verses 14 to 16. Reading in COL 69, we see what this first harvest is all about. And before I read that, the first harvest in Revelation chapter 14, 14 to 16. This is the harvest. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle. Because the harvest is come, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a quotation of the verse 2 Peter 3.12. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world will be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest will be ripened, and Christ will come to gather the precious grain. And so, the first harvest you see in the book of Revelation 
chapter 14, 14 to 16, is the gathering in of God's people, the people who have reproduced the image of God in their lives. These are the people who have reproduced the image of God in their life. And uh, in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 12, where the quotation was, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And so we are told not only to wait for the coming of the Lord, but to hasten His coming in this world. We are to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. By how? By bearing the fruit. For immediately, when the fruit is brought forth, then the sickle is put in. You cannot put in the sickle when there is no fruit. You cannot put in the sickle when there is no fruit. And then we go to the second harvest of the book of Revelation. The second harvest of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verses 17 downwards. We read, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Remember that God, by the way, is not waiting upon the world. God is not waiting upon the world to be so much sinful so that he may manifest himself in his church. He may come to take his own. The Lord is waiting for his bride to be ready. And when the bride is ready, then he comes to take it as his own. It is not about the church or the world being so sinful that makes Christ come, but the church being ready. And so the first harvest is when the fruit is put forth, the fruit of the church. Then, after the church is gathered, now the Lord has something to do with the wickedness that exists in the world. And there is the second harvest we read in Revelation chapter 14, 17 to 20. It says, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice, cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So the harvest of the righteous happens, and then the second harvest, which is of the wicked, happens. And how do we know that the harvest of Revelation chapter 14, 17 to 20 is of the wicked? I'd like you to see what happens in verse 19. And the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. This is the anger of the Lord. So this is not the harvest of the righteous, but the harvest of the wicked, because it is the wrath of God. This second harvest is the harvest of the wicked, and not the harvest of the righteous because it is a harvest of anger when he was talking about the first harvest revelation 14 16 to 17 14 to 16 there is no wrath of god but when he speaks about the second harvest 17 to 20 you see in verse 19 there is great winepress of the wrath of god then in verse 20 
it says, and the winepress was trodden without the city. Notice the words without the city. This is the greatest harvest. Now, a simple question that you should ask yourself in this harvest. What is without the city? What is without the city? And uh, I like to put some verse on it. Uh, without the city. And so, first of all, uh, without the city is outside the gates. Uh, sorry, without the city is without the gates. And so I'm looking at that. Uh, oh no. without the city, outside the gates, outside the gates. Bear with me for a moment. Yes. Look at uh, Revelation 22 verse 15. We are talking about, we have talked about the harvest, the first harvest, which is the harvest of the righteous, Revelation 14 to 16, 14 verse 14 to 16, and you find that in COL, 69 but the second harvest verse revelation 14 verses 17 uh 20 it is the harvest of the wicked and it says that uh, the wine press was trodden without the city and so and it was the wrath of god so who are without the city who are outside the gates revelation 22 15 Revelation chapter 22, 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers and warmongers and murderers and adulterers and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So, look here. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. This is what we read. Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into in through the gates into the city. So those who do the commandments of God enter through the gates into the city. But without the gates and the city are dogs, sorcerers, warmongers, murderers, and adulterers. Let us go back to Revelation chapter 14 there. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 the second harvest, verses 14 to 17. We are looking at the presentation, the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God. And we are looking at the two harvests. The first harvest is in Revelation chapter 14, verses 14 to 16, where actually the fruit is harvested because it is ripe. And they are keeping the commandments of God and they can be able to enter the city and the gates. Now in verse 17 to 20, these are harvested, but they are put in the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city. That is what we are saying. Without the city and the gates, in Revelation chapter 15, are the dogs, the warmongers, and such a like people who have such a things. So the harvesting of the earth per se, doesn't depend on the wickedness of the world because the first harvest is of the saints, of the people who are ready to enter into the city. Then the Lord can see that these people have ripened and have the fruit and this world cannot host them. Talking about the seventh day Advent is reaching at a point where actually the world cannot accept them and then the world comes to take them as his own. Um, you go to fundamental of Christian uh, education, 287. Fundamental of Christian education, page 287. Uh, 289, sorry, paragraph 1. 289, paragraph 1. When we reach the standard, actually, look uh, at this what the prophet says there are many in the church who at heart belong to the world 
but God calls upon those who claim to believe the advanced truth to rise above the present attitude of the popular churches of today. Where is the self-denial? Where is the cross-bearing that Christ has said should characterize his followers? The reason we have had so little influence upon unbelieving relatives and associates is that we have manifested little decided difference in our practices from those of the world. Parents need to awake and purify their souls by practicing the truth in their home life. When we reach the standard that the Lord will have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, stateless, and extremist. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And then the Lord will come and take them as his own. Then the angel of Revelation chapter 18 will be seen with a mighty glory upon the face of the earth. We are talking about the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God. And we are looking at these two harvests. And so, uh, what is this experience that um, we are talking about? And uh, these are the program of events. These are the programs of events. I'd like to share with you the program of events as they are chronicled. The program of events. And so here we go. These are the programs of events. First of all, we are in the day of atonement where we have to afflict our souls. Number two, there will be a mighty sifting on the day of atonement. And number three, the fifth garments will be taken away as you read it in the book of Zechariah where Joshua appears before the angel. And then the filthy rags are taken away and we are clothed with the robe of Christ. It is under... When you think about the wedding scenario in this... Uh, issue of putting on clothes i don't know i don't know the day that uh, should i say i don't know that that is uh, an implicit uh, bad st statement where when does the bride put on the wedding garment that uh, the bridegroom have provided think about that and so we have to afflict our soul the mighty sifting takes place filthy garment removed, and then clothed with the Christ robe, then God puts a seal on us, like you are signing a document. And then it is rubber stamped with the seal that cannot be revoked. Then we have the latter rain doing its work, and the, this latter rain is what emboldened the saints to sound the loud cry. And then we have, after the loud cry, then we have the close of probation. This is uh, the program of events in how they have to happen. And then, uh, between as the day of atonement starts, because the day of atonement starts with the afflicting of souls, in between there are some events that have to happen before the close of probation. So, in the starting of the day of atonement, we have the afflicting of the soul, and in between we have uh, five things that have to happen. The mighty sifting, the filthy garment taken away, clothed with Christ's robe, seal of God being put on the saints, the latter rain falling, and then la loud cry. That is the first, second, and third angel swelling into a loud cry. They are repeated with, um, what does the prophet say that the Revelation 18 angels is? I, I like to look at it once again so that uh, we may see what uh, this angel is. Uh, it says with additional mention, additional mention, I can't remember where it is, but I'll like, try to look, additional mention. Hmm? Yes, I'll write in 277, thank you. Uh, I'll write in 277, look at uh, the, uh, the angel of Revelation 18 when it comes down, what it will do. I'm looking at... Uh, Early writings, page, uh, page 277, basically. This is what uh, it says. And you should queue in 
You should write besides Revelation chapter 18, early writings 277. It's so good. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven, descending to the earth and again ascending to heaven, preparing for the fulfillment of some important event. Then I saw another angel. Then I saw another mighty angel commissioned to descend to the earth to unite his voice with the third angel and give power and force to his message. Great power and glory were imparted to the angel, and as he descended, the earth was lightened with his glory. The light which attended this angel penetrated everywhere. As he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean, hateful bird. The message of the fall of Babylon, as given by the second angel, is repeated with the additional mention of corruptions we have, which have been entering the churches since 1844. The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in in the last great work of the third angel's message as it swells to a loud cry. So we have the second angel's message uniting with the third angel's message. And then this is the angel of Revelation chapter 18, which is the fourth angel's message. And what is the main purpose of the, of the fourth angel's message? To mention the additional corruption that have been entering the churches since 1844. But not only that, the glory of the church have to shine upon the whole church and so that light may be separated from darkness and it may bring about the two harvests, the harvest of the righteous and the harvest of the wicked. That is happening in Revelation chapter 14, 16 to 20. Revelation chapter 14, 14 to 21, uh, I bet. Revelation chapter 14, uh, 14 to 20, so not to 21. We don't have verse 21. And so, the work of this angel comes in at the right time to join in the last great work of the third angel's message at its swells to loud cry. And the people of God are thus prepared to stand in the hour of temptation, which they are soon to meet. I saw a great light resting upon them, and they united to fearlessly proclaim the third angel's message. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This message seems to be an addition to the third angel's message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. The glory of God rested upon the patient waiting saints, and they fearlessly gave the last solemn warning, proclaiming the fall of Babylon and calling upon God's people to come out of her that they might escape her fearful doom. Early writing 277. So we are seeing the separation that is happening, the separation of Revelation chapter 14, 14 to 16, and 17 to 20. As we draw closer to the end, then there is this parallel roads that people are riding on. Some are riding on Revelation chapter 14, 14 to 16, and some are on the road of Revelation chapter 14, 17 to 20. And the gap widens and the light is separated from the darkness in that there is no deception that will go on. The Lord says that the people of God shall be known at that time. This is what will happen at such a time as that. And so, going on back to the presentation, this is it. That um, during this time between mighty sifting and uh, the latter rain and loud cry, there is investigative judgment and the judgment of the living. We know very well that the judgment started with the dead, and no one knows know how soon it will pass from the dead to the living. And so Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with the peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of atonement. When you look at uh, the book of Zechariah, where actually Joshua is seen being clothed with the garment, the filthy garments being taken away. 
I'd like to look at this vision. I'm having a great time, brothers and sisters. Revela the, the book of Zechariah. The vision of Joshua in chapter 3. Let us look at the vision of Joshua in uh, Zechariah chapter 3. And uh, as I told you, I'm having a good time. I'm not in a hurry in any way. I want to make this thing clear to all of us. <coughs> and whichever information the Lord adds unto it today, I want to share with you people. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 10. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Let us look at it as we, the Lord bless us in this presentation, the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God. And if you are in Zechariah chapter 3, I want you to put something besides Zechariah chapter 3. Put there 5... T, page 472 to 475. You want to check out these things and see them clearly by yourself. I'll put besides Zechariah chapter 3, 5T, that is Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 472 to 475. If you haven't put down that, put it down. If you haven't done that, put it down. Because it is essential. Have your pen, have your paper, have your writing pad, have everything to make your notes. So, I'll go back to the presentation. No, I'll go back to the reading of Zechariah. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have chosen thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair meter upon his head. So they set a fair meter upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus said the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. These are the angels. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men one that art, for behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree, because now it is producing fruit. It is not like the fig tree of Israel where it was only producing leaves. And so, you see, the time of affliction has started. Look here. The time of affliction has started, and then there is the mighty sifting. In the mighty sifting, we have Zechariah's vision, which applies to us as a peculiar people of God, and the experience of Joshua must be our experience. The removing of the filthy garments and being clothed with the robe of God continued on. As Joshua was pleading before the angels of the remnant church with brokenness of heart and earnest faith, plead for pardon, deliverance through Jesus, their advocate. Am I going so fast? No. They are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their life. They see their weakness and unworthiness, and as they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. They, the tempter stands to, by to accuse them as he stood by, by to resist Joshua. He points to their filthy garments, their defective characters. As the people of God afflict their soul before him, pleading for purity of heart, the command is given, take away the filthy garments from them, and the encouraging words are spoken. 
we are going through slowly testimonies to the church volume 5 page 472 to 475 the experience of joshua the experience of joshua the experience that god's people have to go through even at a, a, such a time as this and so these are the words that are spoken behold i have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and i will clothe thee with the change of rhyming this is the quotation uh found in uh, zechariah chapter 3 verses 4 i'll blow it on the screen next. now Zechariah chapter 3 verses 4. This is the blessed statement that is made to the people of God. I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll clothe thee with the change of raiment. And which raiment is given to the saints at this moment? Which raiment is given to the people uh, or uh, to the saints uh, at this moment? which uh, raiment is given to the people at this moment. Uh, is it uh, Isaiah 63 verse 10? Let us see. Isaiah 63 10? No. Not that. 61 verse 10 and 11. This is the robe that we must have. Isaiah 61.10 I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. This is the robe that actually the people of God must have for to be sealed with the seal of God. To be sealed with the seal of God. And so the Lord will cause our iniquity to pass away the spotless robe of Christ's righteousness is placed upon the tried tempted yet faithful children of God remember what the book of um, the book of uh, Malachi chapter 3 says that I'll be unto them like a fuller soap I'll sit among them as a refiner and I'll purify the children of Judah so that they may offering the offering of, like of the past, the offerings without sin. The despised remnant are clothed in glorious apparel, never more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Their names are retained in the Lamb's Book of Life, enrolled among the faithful of all ages. They have res resisted the wiles of the deceiver. They have not been turned from their loyalty by the dragon's roar. Now they are eternally secure from the tempter's device holy angels and sin were passing to and fro placing upon them the seal of the living god and so these are the observations to make the setting of the entire thing is in the typical day of atonement don't forget that the setting is in the anti-typical day of atonement number two god's people afflict their soul in full consciousness of their sinfulness now, this point is so much important that uh, I'll not just pass it by as if it was a mere saying. I'd like to point out about the God's people have lived their soul in full consciousness of their sinfulness. I'd like to remind you one thing, and uh, this should be found in, uh, uh, in COL 160. This is a, a familiar quotation. I'll start from 159 going down to 160.3. Christ object lessons. I want you to listen to this very well. And if you are taking the quotes and king in the verses, go COL 159 to 160. Put it besides the book of Leviticus. 
the book of Leviticus chapter 23 this is important the book of Leviticus 23 verses 27 if you are putting besides put there C O L one fifty nine to one sixty. That is besides Leviticus twenty three verses twenty seven. Now hear what it says. Let me read the verse first, and then I'll read the quote. Leviticus twenty three twenty seven. What does the Lord say? Leviticus twenty three twenty seven. And 28. Brothers and sisters, this is the presentation, the experience that will bring God's people the seal of God, the number nine, number 10 in the series, the latter rain. The word of God says, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your soul, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. So what we are looking is afflict your soul and offer an offering made by fire. Look what it says, that God's people afflict their soul in full consciousness of their, sinfulness, of their sinfulness. So what does it mean to afflict your soul in full consciousness of the, your sinfulness? The verse I'm saying is, Put besides Leviticus 23:27, put there Christ object lesson C O L 159 to 160, and we read it now. Let us read it right away. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. When the day of atonement starts, it is not only that time that you have to renounce by yourself uh, self that is in you or in me, but it is a continual process of sanctification. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on power outside of ourselves. We are consciousness of our sinful self. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual honest heart-breaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. The nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly we discern the purity of His character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting self. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. The apostle Peter became a faithful minister of Christ and he was greatly honored with the divine light and power. He had an active part in the upbuilding of Christ's church, but Peter never forgot the fearful experience of his humiliation. His sin was forgiven, yet well he knew what for the weakness of character which he had caused his fall only the grace of Christ could avail. He found in himself nothing on which to glory. Listen to this, none of the apostles or prophets or even claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived nearest to God, men who will sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men who God had honored with divine light and power have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So will it be with all who behold Christ. At every advanced step in Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom the Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourself in your own sight. Ezekiel 36, 31. Again he says, I'll establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame. When I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, said the Lord. Ezekiel 
16, 62, and 63. Then our lips will not be open in self-glorification. We shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone. We shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good things, Romans 7, 18. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, Galatians 6, 14. And so we can see what it means to afflict our souls in full consciousness of our own sinfulness. So the setting of the time is in the day, antitypical day of atonement, and the people understand that in them there is no righteousness that, that can be offered before the Lord. In fact, when we are talking about thinking that we have anything good that can be given to the, to the Lord, will I remember the quote really? It will be treason. Hmm? Counted as treason. If such a thing will happen that we if we say that uh, our works could merit us to go to heaven the angels would consider it as treason to the government of God. Let me see if I can give you this. This is 1888 messages, page 816, paragraph 1. If anyone could think that the righteousness that they have could make them have an entrance into heaven, look at this. I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers, all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclinations, all the pardon of sins. In presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit. The proposition will be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshroud his person, they are looking upon the Lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation, to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? Continued on. Jesus takes away the filthy garments and seals his people. Clad then in the arm of Christ's righteousness, not in filthy garments, the church, prophets and kings, page 725, the church is to end upon her final conflict Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. He is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. I was shown those who I had before seen, weeping and praying in agony of spirit. The company of guardian angels round them had been doubled, and they were clothed with an armor from their head to their feet. Early writings, page 271. And... Uh, so, these are the things that we see. We have the, just repeating, we have the afflicting of the soul. We have the filthy government to be removed, clothed with Christ's robe, seal of God, and then they moved in exact order. When we have the seal of God, we will move in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenance expressed the severe conflict which they had endured, the agonizing struggle they had passed through, yet their features marked with severe internal anguish, now shone with the light and glory of heaven. And that's why Paul says, Paul says in the book of Romans, uh, 
and I want you to key this in in the book of Romans. I want you to, what the word of the Lord says, the prophet says, in the book of Romans, I suppose it is in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verses 18. Romans chapter 8 verses 18. Romans chapter 8 verses 18. And besides Romans 8 verses 18, I want you to put there something. We are studying the word of the Lord. This is no preaching. This is no normal preaching. This is a study. Romans Romans 8.18 I want you to, you to key in this in the book of Romans 8.18 Put there early writing 2.71 Early writing 271 and I'll tell you what first of all let me read Romans 8 18 for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us now look at early writings 271 it says they moved in exact order like a company of soldiers. Their countenances expressed the severe conflict which they had endured. Romans 8, 18 talks about the suffering of this present time, the severe conflict, the agonizing struggle they had passed through. Yet their features marked with severe internal anguish now shone with the light and glory of heaven. So the suffering that you are having at the present time cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in the future. So that is why I am king in Romans 8, 18 with early writing 2, 71. Continuing with the presentation. They had obtained the victory and it called for them the deepest gratitude and holy sacred joy. Evil angels still pressed around them but could have no power over them. I asked what had made this great change. And an angel answered, it is the latter rain. It is the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the third angel. The loud cry of the third angel. The people were focused on what was happening in the sanctuary above and uh, what Christ was doing, the battle ending. This is what the people had focused on. Nothing could sway them in any way. The glory of the Lord was being revealed in their life. This was the latter end, the refreshing from the refreshing from the Lord. This is the experience that the people of God must have in order to receive the latter rain. This is the experience that the people of God must have to receive the latter rain uh, of God in such a time that um, we are living in. And so, how I'm praying that uh, this experience may be ours as we continue in this study. So, the remnants gets clothed with the Christ, the robe of Christ, Christ's righteousness. They receive the latter rain. They are able to sound the light cry and the message is going forth, conquering to conquer. Uh, you look at the first seal when it, the Christ was here on the earth and uh, we know that um, this was in the days of uh, the apostles. They went forth, conquering to conquer. The message went forth with light. Christ was in, in their midst and uh, they were able under the first seal to do a work unsurpassed. But we shall see that in the time of um, the latter rain, even the work will go forth with mighty power. And so we have to receive the seal of God and we have to sound the latter, uh, the, the loud cry. Now, look at this. This is uh, 
5t page 214 5t page 214 we read that uh, Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement, then the latter rain will fall upon us. Observation once again, filthy garments must be removed, then receive the seal of God, then God bestowed his latter rain. And this is the chart as we are going through it slowly and slowly and looking at these things if they be so. So, afflict the soul is to remedy defects in character. Remedy defects in character. Then, receive the seal of God. And then, the latter rain that joins in with the loud cry. So, so this, this is the proposed events for God's people as follows. The shaking, the lettering of the loud cry, the sealing in the midst is happening. To realize the fallacy of placing the sealing of God's people after the lettering and loud cry, please consider three simple and straightforward propositions. This, this is what the people propose, that there is a shaking, the lettering, and the loud cry. But uh, this is some fallacy because you can't sound, you can't receive the lettering and sound the loud cry without being sealed. The condition of God's people immediately prior to being sealed. One, the thoroughness of the shaking. And then the glorious state of the church during the latter rain which follows the shaking. So you cannot interchange that the sealing comes after the latter rain and loud cry. No. We must be sealed with the seal of God. On, on this point I like to put something on the screen. There is some um, Last day events, page 179. There is uh, some teaching that uh, the latter rain and loud cry happens, then the sealing. No, that one cannot happen because it is only a people who are sealed that can go forth, can receive the... We remedy the defect of the character, then we are sealed, we receive the latter rain and go ahead and sound the loud cry. LDE 179.2 also found in 3SM385. So sealing comes before latter rain and loud cry. The greatest issue so near at hand, the enforcement of Sunday laws, will weed out from those whom God has not appointed and will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. So you cannot say that the sealing comes after the latter rain. The sealing has to happen. And God have a pure sanctified ministry that now can receive the latter rain and go forth to sound the loud cry. So uh, uh, the idea that um, the ceiling is after the latter rain and the loud cry actually is a lie. That is not the truth. Just even look at Revelation chapter 7 itself. These people are sealed and then when they are sealed, the 144 are seen standing on Mount Zion with the lamb with the father's name in their forehead then follows the three angels messages so you have the ceiling the hundred and foot four sealed in their head and then you have the three angels messages following which is attended with the latter rain and then swells into a loud cry i hope you are seeing and understanding this and so Especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fall before the throne of God, will they feel most deeply the wrong of God's professed people? Those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by the mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and cry for all the abomination that be done in the church. This is Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 4, the man with an inho, the man in linen going around the city. And uh, so we have to receive the, we have to afflict our soul on the day of atonement. Then in afflicting our soul, our filthy garments are removed. Then we are clothed with God's own robe. God stamps on us his seal 
and then he pours his latter rain on us and then we can go forth to sound the loud cry so sigh and cry in the time of affliction then the mark of man in linen and the time at the time when the danger and depression of the church are greatest the little company who are standing in the light will be sighing and crying for the abomination that are done in the land but more especially with their prayers arise in behalf of the church because it is members are doing after the manner of the world now i want you to go to the book of ezekiel chapter 9 let us go there we are not in a hurry today brothers and sisters we want to learn the experience that god's people must have to receive the seal of god Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9, I hope to be there in a minute. And I want you to take your pen and key in something in Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4, I want you to put there 5T, that is Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, pages 209 to... 2.11 and I'll read Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 4. What does it say? Ezekiel 9.4 where we are king in uh, 5 to 2.11 Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 4 Are you there brothers and sisters? It says, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. Right there, key in 5T, 209-211, which says, At the time when the danger and depression of the church are greatest, the little company who are standing in the light will be sighing and crying for the abomination that are done in the land, but more especially with their prayers arise in behalf of the church because it is members are doing after the manner of the world. They mourn before God to see religion despised in the very homes of those who have great life. They lament and afflict their soul because pride, avarice, selfishness, and deception of almost every kind are in the church. The class who do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declination nor mourn over the sins of others will be left without the seal of God so this is it we are just building the the, the chart and filling in the blanks and looking at our Bibles what this says actually so in affliction of the soul we have the remedy of defects we have to sigh and cry and then uh, we have the seal of God coming upon us, the mark of the man in linen. That is uh, Ezekiel chapter 9 verses 4. And uh, the, let us look at the thoroughness of the shaking. We are almost quarter way or halfway of what we are presenting. The thoroughness of the shaking. In the mighty sh sh shifting soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is near when the Lord will manifest that he is found in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his flaw or flaw. That is flaw, not flaw. There is a sifting to be done so that the wheat must be separated from the tears. And so now we have to key in something in uh, our graph the mighty sifting or the shaking that takes place uh, amidst the church and so here we move a little bit and there a little bit and there in a little bit and there we move a little bit and we remain with number six continued on all that every lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that god is about to make among his professed people 1190 God's people will be sifted even as corn is sifted in a sieve until all the chaff is separated from the pure kernels of grain. We think that this is a simple thing. Now, if you want to understand that uh, the sifting is not a simple work, if you want to understand that this is not a, a mere sifting that you do when you go with your grains to the portion mill to sift, 
Uh, think about uh, at the time of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Leave alone that. Let us go back to the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Uh, we found that uh, there were over 600,000 people that came from Egypt. But uh, when the children of Israel were crossing the river Jordan, all the old men have died, those who despised the Lord. And then uh, the younger ones crossed and went. And then we had the wars going on in the book of Judges. Remember the war by, um, is it uh, Gideon? Who is that guy? And he selected over 30,000 to go and fight in the army. But uh, when the number was made up, it was not more than 700 people. That is the sifting that we are talking about from 30,000 to 7,000 people. 700, 7,000. Is it 700? 7,000. That uh, remained after the sifting had taken place. Also, uh, also in the, when the Lord came, his first advent, and uh, we had so many people uh, professing to believe in Jesus Christ. He had only 12 to work with and even one apostasy. In 1844, again we had, uh, uh, we had uh, over 50,000 that were waiting for Jesus Christ. Many people that joined the faith, but um, when the when the Lord did not come back in 1844, we only remain with 50 people, a number. In 1888, we find that a few were in truth, three, four, not more than ten, that accepted the message of righteousness by faith. And so, when uh, we speak about uh, this sifting that has to happen among God's people, actually, it will be a terrible thing. And I pray that while the people are sifted out, you, you, you should be sifted in. While the people are being sifted out, please be sifted in. And so we have, the church may appear as about to fall. This is a quote that has been used by many. But it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted. The chaff separated from the precious wood. This is a terrible deal, but nevertheless it must take place the church that is about to fall which church is this is it laudition church it can never be laudition church but this is the philadelphia church the enemy is pressing it upon with all torrents of affliction and persecution and all that when you look at it it may appear to fall but no 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 the sinners are sifted away while christ remains with a pure church. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. We must divest of our self-righteousness and arrayed in righteousness of Christ. Now I want you to do something. She talks about guile and overcoming with the blood of the Lamb. Put 12 MR 324. Besides, I want you to put 12 MR 324 besides Revelation 13 MR. No, this is 12 MR, sorry. 12 MR. 324 put it besides revelation 12 11 and 14 5 14 So, none but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. Let us post there. Revelation 12, 
verses 11. Revelation 12 verses 11. Overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12 verses 11. It reads thus. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Do you see that? This is it. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. So, again, go back. None by those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb. 12.11 and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Now, she goes ahead and says that they are without spot or stain, without guile in their mouths. Revelation 14, Revelation 14, verses 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They are without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouth. This is the experience that the people of God must have before they receive the seal of the living God. Continued on. Now, this is a sad quote that I have to read, but nonetheless, I must read it. Great Controversy 88 edition. 1888 edition, page 608, paragraph 1. This is a solemn quote. It says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Many of, a tale, men, many of talent and pleasing others who once rejoice in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to mislead represent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. So, don't expect persecution from without. There is something that Paul says in the book of Acts. There is something that Paul says in the book of Acts. I'd like us to read it. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30. Acts chapter 20, 28 to 30. It says this. The fear from within than the fear from without. Acts chapter 20 verses 28 to 30. Take heed therefore unto yourself and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter, into, in, enter in among you not sparing the flock. Also of your own soul selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now, key in Acts chapter 20. Key in Acts chapter 20. Verses Acts chapter 20, 25 to 30. Put there. 
GC 88 page 608 paragraph 1 the fear is always more from within than from the without in fact uh, mo most of the time we talk about Rome I want to show you something about Rome something that maybe you have ever seen I touched on it in some other things if we studied prophecy we will have less to speak about Rome I hope I get this if we study prophecy very well the fear is mostly from within not from without oh no the fear is from within than from without and so as uh, the third angel's message swells into a loud cry we will see more people we will see more people from our ranks joining in with the enemies and reporting the seventh day adventist um, to, to to the churches and uh, tm 111.2 tm 1 12.2 it says this fear from within than from without there is need of much closer study of the word of God especially should Daniel and Revelation have attention as never before in the historic of our work we may have less to say in some lines in regard to the power Roman power and the papacy but we should call attention to what the prophets and apostles have written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God the Holy Spirit has so shaped both in the giving of the prophecy and in the events portrayed as to teach that the human agent is to be kept out of sight hid in Christ and that the Lord of God of heaven and his law are to be exalted read the book of Daniel Call up point by point the history of kingdoms they are represented. Behold, statesmen cancels powerful armies and see how God wrote to abase the pride of men and lay human glory in the dust. And so, if uh, we will study the prophecies very well, we will have little to speak about Rome from, because the greatest persecution will not come from Rome, but will come from the apostates who have been within. The time is not far distant when the test will be will come to every soul. In this time, the goal will be separated from the dross in the church. True godliness will be clearly distinguished from the appearance and tinsel of it. Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only flaws of rich wheat. All who assume the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. Testimonies. To the church volume 5 page 80 and 81 what else can i add the faithful sigh and cry for the condition of the church when it is danger and depression are greatest the church appears as if about to fall in this attitude of deep affliction for the sins in the church they are sealed then so we have the graph there we are almost coming to an end so let us look at the last things last three slides we have the judgment of the dead which has been going on since 1844 it will move suddenly to the living we shall have the final shaking the ceiling the latter in the loud cry other ship and the matas coming in then we shall have the last seven plague bread and bread and water is sure so we are in preparation time the church militant trouble coming upon the earth then trouble continuing and then we shall have what we call the great crisis the seven last plague during this time the 144 are sealed and they are whole with there is no tears church triumphant little time of trouble can relieving growing our own food as this happens then 
in the Middle East, death decree, close of probation. 144, no mediator. They are living at Jacob's time of trouble. The day and hour is announced. There is a Magidion happening. And then, second coming. The message is, get ready, get ready, get ready. The church has to turn, turn from the church militant to the church, a whole week, a victorious church. And so, uh, I also that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. I'm writing 71.1. So, Church Milton, again, we have trouble continuing, and then, Holy Week Church triumphant, death decree, time and hour is given, a Magidion is going on, and then, said the angel, deny ye, deny self, you must step fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and to advance step by step, and every step we have taken has given us strength to take the next. But now time is almost finished, and what we have been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Those who will not receive the mark of the beast and his image when the decree goes forth must have decision now to say nay. We will not regard the institution of the beast. Early writing, page 67, paragraph 2. And so, brothers and sisters, we are in that time when we must have the experience of a whole wheat church. Nothing should come in. Nothing should come in to interfere with our experience. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus Christ? I can assure you that we are entering into little time of trouble. And so I leave you with this. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few this will be our test at this time we must gather warmth from the coldness of others courage from the cowardice and loyalty from their oppression when every other trust fail then it will be seen who have an abiding trust in jehovah and while the enemies of truth are on every side watching the lord's servants for evil god will watch over them for good he will be to them as a shadow of great rock in weary land I'm praying one thing, that at such a time as this, when the champions of truth are few, God will have you, God will have me, stand for him. May the Lord embrace this truth upon our souls. May he keep us for his service. And more so, may we have this experience that is needed, that the Lord may have us and use us to sound the three angels' messages to the globe. Not for any gain, not for any prosperity, but for vindicating the character of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we know the experience that we need, you can be able to give us. And so help us to endure until the end with unflinching faith, Give us the boldness that you gave unto the apostles and even more that we may be able to stand the troubles of this time. In Jesus' name, Amen.